Luke. We are in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. If you'd like to turn there. Imagine what it would be like to be born without arms and legs. We've uh, mentioned this gentleman before here, but I don't know if you were here, all of you, the time I mentioned him. Uh, do you think life would be easy if you were born without arms and legs? I don't think, I don't think it would be. Um, this man's name is Bill, or pardon me, Nick Bill Jessic. And uh, that's the way you pronounce his last name, but it's not spelled like that. Neil, uh, pardon me, Nick, uh, Bill Jessic. And I want to read to you something he wrote, something he said, part of his testimony. My name is Nick, Bill Jessic, and I am thankful to have been born 30 years ago with no arms and no legs. Can you imagine that? He is thankful he was born without arms and legs. And he went on to write, or say, I won't pretend my life is easy, but through the love of my parents, loved ones, and faith in God, I've overcome my adversity, and my life is now filled with joy and purpose. I reside now in California with my wife, and we both love seeing people's lives change for the better or touched in some way. It is my hope that your life is positively impacted by my story. So he has no arms, he has no legs. And it's like he's saying, thank you God for not healing me, for not giving me arms and legs. He has traveled to over 63 countries. He's been on six continents in our world. He has spoken in countless schools, churches, prisons, orphanages, hospitals, stadiums. And of course, he's talked with many people face to face. And he has led many people to faith in Christ. And he's thankful he was born with an art, without arms and legs. Why do I mention this man at the beginning of my sermon? Uh, well, I, I will explain it as we go through the message. So Luke chapter 13, verse 10, it says, And he, that is Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit. And she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are free from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and be began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? And as he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things done by him. So he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden. And it grew and became a tree and birds of the air nested in its branches. And by the way, I thought you might be interested to see what a mustard tree looked like after it was grown. You could see how the birds would nest in that type of tree. And it's uh, the next parable he shares in verse 20. And again he said, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Now, pardon me, I'll turn this off. All right. 
So the woman in this story had been crippled for 18 years. She had a sickness that was caused by a spirit. Now some may say the New Testament does not distinguish between different types of sicknesses, but actually it does. In Luke 13, 32, which is just a little further in, these, uh, in this chapter, he says, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. So there are different types of illnesses that people can have. People can have a spiritual illness. They can have a mental illness. They can have a physical illness. Now, some people say uh, demons do not exist. <coughs> they do exist. But that's not the focus of my message today. I'm going to focus on the Lord Jesus. And I want to remind you of what James 4, 7 says before we focus on Jesus. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So the one we really need to pay attention to, the one we really need to respect and love is Jesus. All right, so notice this healing occurred in a synagogue. Now, uh, I thought about, uh, would you all like to see what it would be like to be a woman that's been over for 18 years? If you want to, you could all stand up with me and bend over like this and walk around like that for a few minutes. <laughs> I, I don't think anyone wants to really do that. And she probably had some pain and, uh, and as well. But notice this sickness that she had did not keep her from going to the synagogue. She went to the synagogue and, and she wanted to worship God. <coughs> uh, and as I prepared this message, I was reminded Many years ago, in a church where I was interim pastor, we would have a group of people come from a, I'm not sure where they were coming from, but many of them were disabled in various ways. Young man, one young man was in a wheelchair, and I don't remember all the details, but he could not get up out of that wheelchair on his own. But he came to faith in Christ, and he wanted to be baptized. Have you seen someone baptized that was in a wheelchair before? What do you do? <laughs> well, uh, I wanted him to be baptized. That's what he wanted. He wanted to follow the Lord in baptism. Uh, wouldn't it just a little sprinkle do? Well, that's not the word. That's not what the word baptism means. That's another ser sermon for another time. So here's what we did. Some of the, we we moved some choir and some of the chairs out of the choir loft. And some gentlemen in the church, maybe some deacons, helped this young man. They took him up to the, the choir loft in front of the baptistry. Then several of these men reached down and picked him up and lifted him into the baptistry. And I think I had someone else helping me or maybe a couple of other gentlemen in the baptistry with me. And we said it and we, we we took him and set him down in a chair and I baptized him. Uh, by the way, it's easy to baptize someone if they're sitting in a chair. You just lean the chair back and then bring them back up. Uh, it was a time of rejoicing and blessing. Don't let illness keep you from worshiping the Lord. Don't let some problem in your life hold you back from loving God and worshiping him, bitterness in our heart, anger at God's not gonna hurt him, help us. And this woman came to the synagogue that day and the Lord showed up. She'd been ill for 18 years. I can imagine she had been praying for healing. She certainly wanted to be free of this disease and God would answer her prayers. Of course, there are times when God does not heal people, like with Nick, Bill Jessic, but God can use people in mighty ways, oftentimes when they're not healed, and he can have other purposes for not healing us. Uh, sometimes whatever we're going through <coughs> because of our suffering, he can use that in our lives to help comfort others. But I want to focus on, uh, uh, by the way, continue to seek the Lord regardless of what you're going through, one day there will be complete healing. It may not be in this life for us, but one day there will be, uh, and, uh, and that will be when 
when we have put our faith in Jesus and we trust him as Lord and the time comes we go into his presence and we will have renewed bodies, the scripture says. One day we will have re imperishable bodies, Paul calls them. So what I want to know to focus first uh, on this passage is that love conquers evil in God's kingdom. Again, this woman had been uh, had this problem for 18 years. She was uh, surely having pain at times, and and it, 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 she she uh, must have, it must have been a very difficult life for her. Uh, we can pray for healing. Sometimes God will use others to help us with whatever we're going through. And again, God one day will heal us all, that all of those who put our faith in Jesus. We will have imperishable bodies, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 42. But again, God may not heal us now so that he can use us in a special way, like with Nick, Bill, Jesse. Uh, also, he can allow us to go through problems and difficulties in our life so we can know him better. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, eight and nine, 12 verses 8 and 9, concerning this, his thorn in the flesh, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness. So God, I, I want to be, you know, if you pray, God, I want to be everything you want me to be then don't be surprised if you become weak in some ways because that's the way he perfects power in us. And now it's, I'm not saying it's easy to go through that. Paul prayed three times this thorn to be removed from his flesh. But God knows what's best for us. This woman's illness led her to see her need for Christ. This is a very important to realize the problems and the trials and the difficulties we go through can help us to see our need for Christ. There was someone at that synagogue service that had a greater spiritual problem than this woman. It was the synagogue ruler. He was spiritually blind. Here was the Messiah, the promised Messiah, and he was ignorant of it. And he did not recognize. Here was a marvelous miracle performed, and he was not rejoicing, but she was rejoicing. And Luke 13, verses 12 and 13 says, when Jesus saw her, he called her over and <coughs> said to her, woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. Imagine if she had missed the synagogue service that day. Imagine if she had, when Jesus said, woman, uh, come to, over to me, he called her over, the scripture says in verse 12, he called her over, come over here to me. Imagine if she shook her head no. Please hear me. When the Lord calls you to do something, please don't shake your head no. Please don't do that. God has reasons we don't know of when he calls us to do something. Please don't shake your head no. Again, the greatest cripple present was not that woman. It was the synagogue ruler, the official. He didn't see his need for healing. She saw her need for healing and she came to know who Jesus was because of her need for him. God allows us to have needs in our life. I don't know what your needs are, but he allows us to have these needs in our life so we can see our need for him. The synagogue ruler was used by Satan that day. Be careful to keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus. Uh, if we don't do that, we can become like this uh, synagogue ruler. We can become judgmental and critical. Uh, and by the way, there is a time to be critical of others, but it's to be done in a way that Jesus will do it here in a moment. But 
if we're not careful, we can become judgmental and critical of others when we should be rejoicing. And this, uh, this synagogue ruler became critical. Uh, and I, I think of the apostle Peter here. He had a marvelous, marvelous moment when Jesus, uh, uh, you, you know, Jesus, he told Jesus, he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus said, God revealed that to you. And then a few moments later though, he had to say, he had to, say to Peter, rebuke, you know, uh, get behind me, Satan. He had to rebuke Peter. Any of us, if we're not careful, if we don't keep our eyes on the Lord, we can become critical and judgmental. Not just, I'm not talking just about you, I'm talking about me. <laughs> Preachers can do this. So Satan can use any of us. So the synagogue official in verse 14, it says, indignant, <clears throat> pardon me, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, he was saying to the crowd, there are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Pardon me. So he would not rejoice that a wonderful miracle had just taken place. He was too busy judging and condemning and he scolded the congregation. And there's an implication here. Not only was Jesus wrong in healing on the Sabbath, but the, these people, this woman was wrong to even, uh, you know, want to be healed on the Sabbath. Again, this woman's illness was a help to her. It helped her to see her need for the Lord. And people who often need help often cannot be helped because they don't see their need for help. Like this synagogue ruler needed help, but he couldn't see his need for it. You know that love can sometimes lead us to rebuke others. In verse 15, the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? So you care enough about your donkey that you're willing to work on the Sabbath to get your water, uh, your donkey, some water. But you don't care about this person here that's been crippled all these years. You don't care about her. But you care about, a lot about your donkey and you're willing to work for that donkey. You're a hypocrite, Jesus said. Do I believe Jesus said that in love? I believe he did. <laughs> That's what that man needed to hear. The ruler of the synagogue may have not realized it, but he was doing the work of Satan that day. But love conquers evil. God loves to take someone crippled in some way and touch them with his love and use that person to conquer evil. And that's what he's doing with Nick Vilchesek. I'd ask you to pray for him. Um, God could have given him his arms and legs. He could use Nick much greater, though, if he did not have arms and legs. Now, I love this next part of the story in, in the passage we're reading. It says that the healed woman rejoiced. And in verse 17, it says the crowd rejoiced. Uh, the, the, the crowd could have been upset because the synagogue ruler had just scolded them. When he said there's six days in which to work, uh, come on those days to get healed. This is very important for us to hear. Don't let negative people control you by focusing on their negative comments. Look to the Lord and see what he is doing. Now, sometimes it's not easy to see what he's doing, but he's at work and rejoice when you see him at work. Uh, again, don't let the, the, the negative comments of people. By the way, uh, I just wonder what if the, uh, what if this, uh, this synagogue ruler had been 
the one who was bent over and he'd been like that for 18 years and Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. I wonder what then he would have said. Oh, you're not supposed to be healing me on the Sabbath. Uh, make me crippled again. Don't heal me on the Sabbath. Make me crippled again. And let me have that pain back that I was feeling. I'm sure he wouldn't have said that. He, but he loved his, uh, his donkey when he should have loved what Jesus was doing. Okay, first love conquers evil in God's kingdom. Second, I say love conquers everywhere in God's kingdom. Jesus shares two parables. And by the way, I only have two points to this sermon. <laughs> but this next point has two parts to it. So Jesus may have shared these two parables before he left the synagogue. We don't know for sure. Uh, there's some, some scholarly debate about the reason Luke put them here. But uh, let, me, let me just go ahead and, uh, and talk about these parables because they are very, very meaningful. The first one is the parable of the mustard seed. And Jesus says, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? He said, it is like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden. And it grew and became a tree and the birds of the air nested in its branches. This is a very, very encouraging parable to me. And here's part of the reason why. The mustard seed is considered one of the smallest seeds. And Jesus says the kingdom of God, that's the ruling kingdom of our Lord on this earth at the present time. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's not an earthly kingdom at this time. That's the kingdom of God. You take this small seed, you throw it in the garden, and it becomes this huge tree that the birds can nest in. Here's part of what I take from this parable. When you seek to obey the Lord, you or I, when we seek to obey, pardon me, we seek to obey the Lord, you never know how God will use that seed that you planted. Sometimes you'll find out later, but oftentimes you never know how God will use that seed you planted. In other words, little is much if God is in it. You could put it that way. When you're obedient to the Lord, when you feel like he's wanting you to share the Lord with somebody and you do so, you can't go by what their response is. You're putting the seed in there and you don't know what God's going to do with it over the course of time. You may say, well, you know, I look at some people in it that stop coming to church, and that's discouraging. Well, it saddens me when people stop going to church. But keep praying for them. Don't give up on them. Keep praying. The seed's been planted. Moses went out in the wilderness for 40 years. And then God brought him back to free his people from Egypt. Uh, Jonah ran the opposite direction when God told him to go to Nineveh. He ran the opposite direction as fast as he could. There are times when we as believers will go through difficulties. People may stop coming to church at times. Don't give up on them. Keep praying. In other words, this is a normal part of the process. The seed is planted. Someone goes through difficulties and trials. But if they're a child of God, God will continue to work in their life and bring them back in his timing. Now, in this parable, some would like to suggest that the birds nesting in the tree represent Satan. I don't think that's what our Lord's saying at all. I think he's speaking about the way the kingdom of God grows. Let me put it this way. A church in a community may be, seem to others to be small and insignificant. It's not. You never know what 
God has done in the lives of people. And you may know some of it, but you never know how God has used this church. Maybe we're a small church and we planted seeds, but we never know how God has used those seeds to expand his kingdom. And I could give you illustrations of this from history of how God has mightily used people who were seemingly insignificant. It takes time for a seed to grow, by the way. <laughs> As a church, we must continue in faithfulness. We must be patient. God is at work. We can't always see what he's doing. But as we love others, God works. It may be uh, that he uses our witness to someone. Uh, it may be that he just uses us as we give to someone and, and we do it in Jesus' name. Um, as we seek to obey the Lord and follow the Lord, we're planting seeds in the hearts of people and we can't see how God would use that. Now here's part of our problem today. I believe in many of our churches. We want to see results quickly. We want it right now. And I think part of what Jesus is saying here, that's not the way it works. You plant a seed and that seed may become very, a very large tree, but it takes time. I have a cousin named Lance Rogers. I don't know if you've, uh, I've mentioned last to you before. And, and my uncle uh, Gary, uh, pardon me, uncle uh, Jimmy and Aunt Gay were wonderful, wonderful influences in my life. And their youngest child was, was named Lance. And, and Lance as a child always had a smile on his face because he was always up to mischief. Yeah, and he, he just uh, loved, loved to play tricks on people uh, God called him in the ministry as a young man. He surrendered to preach, but he didn't follow the Lord right away. And uh, he became a police officer, a detective. And finally, in 2008, he fully surrendered to the Lord. And in 2009, he enrolled in a seminary. In 2017, he graduated with his master's in theology. It took time for the seed to grow in Lance's heart. We have to be patient. God's love will win out in a believer's life. Lance has told me numerous times, every time I bring someone to faith in Christ, you will be credited by the Lord in some way for how you've ministered to me over the years. It's a blessing to me to hear those words. I'm thankful God used me in some way in his life. And as we obey the Lord, each one of us, we can have, because of God's work through us, we can have uh, the great effect in someone's life and not realize it. But it's not unusual for the, 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 the seed in a, someone's life to grow slowly. And I think of, uh, if, I, if we had time, I'd like to ask each one of you, uh, how, how long did it take before you finally gave yourself fully to the Lord? And if you're not quite there yet, I'd urge you to give yourself fully to the Lord. Uh, but with me, it, it took quite a while. Uh, 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 I just, it didn't take, you know, I, I, it was a process. I'll put it that way. Let's move on to the last parable. And that is, uh, he said in verse 20, and again, he said, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? Is it, it is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. All right, now ladies, uh, if, I, if, you, uh, if I say something incorrect about leaven or yeast, you feel free to correct me at the end of the service. I haven't uh, put much leaven in flour or yeast in flour, but my understanding is when you put the yeast in the flour, uh, it makes the dough rise and then you can bake the dough and you have some bread. That's my understanding. So, uh, so I believe what our Lord is saying here, uh, it's, it's likely he's saying several things. First of all, uh, the kingdom of God 
may have small beginnings. Jesus started with 12 disciples. And now the kingdom of God extends throughout this world. I understand there are some areas of the world that we're still trying to reach with the gospel. And there are many who are seeking to reach different people with the gospel in different parts of the world. But did you know the largest religion in this world, those claiming to be followers of Christ, there's over 2 billion. Now, whether they're all Christians, I don't know. But there's over 2 billion claiming to be Christians in this world. How about those claiming to be Muslims? About 1.2 billion. That's my understanding from some research I've done. So you take a little lemon, you put it in the dough, and I understand it spreads. And God's, God began with 12, Jesus began with 12 apostles, a small group. And now the, uh, the word of the gospel has spread throughout the world. So the kingdom of God also works invisibly. You can't see, the, the leaven is very small, and I understand you can't see it working in the dough. You can't see it doing that. But God's work is invisible oftentimes. We, we can't see all that God is doing. And uh, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, there are times when uh, people will come to me whether it's in this church or another church where I've served and, and they'll share with me something God's doing in their life and it's just so marvelous to hear it and I'd love for everyone to hear it but I, I feel like I, you know should I share this with others or should I let this person share what God is doing they're a wonderful thing and you probably hear of wonderful things that are happening in people's lives because they're seeking to follow the Lord yeah the growth of the Christian faith in a person's heart is almost invisible. Just like the work of that leaven in the dough. I can't see what God's doing in your heart. <laughs> now sometimes I get uh, you know, a glimpse of it by what you say or what you do. Uh, and, but I, I don't know what God's doing in your heart. But I know he's at work in your heart. If you're a believer, he is at work and he is changing you from within, just like that leaven changes the dough. All right, I wanna end with these thoughts. Someone might say, God can't use me, I'm too stupid. Well, uh, God loves to take the foolish of this world and confound the wise. No, there's no one that's too stupid for him to use. Uh, someone may say, God can't use me, I'm too sinful. No, uh, he loves you in spite of your sin. He loves to uh, take sinful people, redeem them, and bless them. And some of the greatest evangelists I know were previously very sinful people, that God has changed their lives. Uh, just the other day, uh, we had a, uh, at the seminary, we had uh, a prison conference. And I came for one of the luncheons and sat down across from a gentleman. This gentleman had been 30 years incarcerated. I don't know what his crime with was, I didn't ask him. God changed his life. Now he's serving as, as a chaplain at a prison and he's working on his doctor of ministry degree and his wife was there with him uh, it's remarkable how God can take the lives of sinful people who are willing to give their lives to him and use them and someone might say God can't use me I don't have any arms and legs no, we know that's not <laughs> we know that's not true because God is using uh, Nick Bill Jessick. Uh, I have other problems. God can't use me. No, God can use you regardless of whatever problems you have or have had. He can use you. If you're willing to 
be a vessel to be used. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, I'm so thankful. We, we tend to judge what's going on in this world by numbers, and we can't see the whole story. I rejoice when I hear of many people being baptized, but I also know from what we read in this, these verses that, and in these parables that you're doing mighty works that we cannot see. And Lord, help us not to focus on the negative things taking place in our world, but instead to focus on you and continue to be faithful to you and trust you to work through us as we seek to be obedient. And Lord, I pray for anyone here that I may need Jesus as Savior. I can't look in everyone's heart. I trust everyone here knows you personally. But if not, I pray, Lord, for someone, if there's someone who doesn't know you personally, that they would come. Jesus would, I believe, say to you, come to me, that is Jesus. Trust him as Savior. If there's someone here who's been struggling with something, some sin in their life, I I pray you might help them to come to me so I can pray for them. Or maybe someone is, uh, needs to recommit their life to you. Maybe someone here has trusted Christ as Savior but never been baptized. Lord, I pray they would come and they would be, follow you in baptism because that's what you command us to do. Lord, may you uh, help us not to say no to you when you say come. And if you're speaking to one of our hearts here, I pray we'd be do what you want. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We'll sing a hymn of uh, invitation. <clears throat>